Okay, so I'm going to present to you homomorphic sortition. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So homomorphic sortition is a single secret leader election protocol, or SSLE for short. And although this is a cryptographic problem, it has a very natural real life counterpart to it. So I've been living in France for quite a while now, and I learned a nice cool French Christmas tradition, which is called the Galette de Roi or the King's Cake. So essentially during the Christmas time, French people, they get together and they share a big cake. And in the cake, they put a small plastic token, which literally is called a fava bean. But for this presentation, I'm going to, to call it a proof. And essentially, once the cake is split, if in your slice you find the proof, you become the king and you can wear a nice golden crown for the rest of the evening. And of course, if you do not find the proof or you try to fake the proof, the other people around the table, they will not acknowledge you as the king. So here we have all the ingredients for what a unnecessary protocol is. We have the requirement of requiring a leader and the identity of the leader remains secret until they're ready to reveal themselves. And we have a verification protocol that allows you to crown correct leaders, but to reject fake leaders. But then for the cryptographic protocol has two main differences from the real life. Notably, first, we do not have a trust baker to trust uh, for baking our cake. Uh, and second of all, in, in real life, if your little brother finds the proof, you can just snatch the proof from them and become the king. So this is essentially a, a front-running attack in cryptography where you see someone trying to send a message, you read the message, and you retransmit it faster than this person trying to crown yourself the king. So here, for example, if Bob tries to become king, our protocol, it has a nice property where the name of the leader comes in the proof. So even though Alice snatches the proof and scratches Bob's name and writes Alice all over it, the verification protocol will actually reject uh, Alice's claim. Okay, so let me get a little more into detail of what are the properties of a single secret leader election. So first of all, we have uniqueness, namely the protocol needs to elect uh, a single leader uh, so we have a single valid proof for each um, execution. And then we have unpredictability. So essentially what happens is that we have the cake. And just by looking at the cake, you cannot tell which proof is inside the cake. You, need, you really need to wait until the leader reveal themselves in order for you to be sure of what is the identity of the leader. And then we're not just like electing leaders the sake of electing leaders, we want to solve consensus with these leaders. And consensus in, this, in, in our target systems, uh, they work on the proof of stake, meaning that uh, the money that different parties have in the system, they must be taken into account in consensus. So for example, if someone like Process Blue here invests 50% of the money of the system, they need to get 50% of the cake for themselves and thus have 50% of chance of being elected. Finally, after paying more than 100 euros for a cake, you better uh, get it done eventually. So our protocol needs to terminate, uh, essentially meaning that the election cannot be forever delayed. It will eventually output the, the results necessary to elect a leader. Okay, so now we talked about getting a secret leader, but why would you care about having a secret leader? So here we have a very simple use case for SSLE. So as I said, we, we want to solve consensus. And in many consensus protocols, the way it works is that the leaders, they have a fixed uh, sequence that they propose blocks. So here, for example, blue is going to propose the first block, then orange, then blue, then pink, and et cetera. And the problem with that is if you consider an adversary who is capable of launching a denial of service attack, so essentially, if we are currently in the third block, we know that blue is going to be the leader. So the adversary can attack blue, is slowing down their network, so their messages arrive too late, and they, all the processes, they just time out and they move forward without waiting for blue. And then because the adversary knows that pink is going to be next, it moves to pink, and then again, it uh, prevents pink from talking. So the solution to this problem is exactly SSLE. Because now, if you do not know who is going to be the leader, you cannot uh, attack them. You need to wait for them to send the message. 
And here we consider a non-rushing adversary. So essentially what we mean by that is that the adversary, they cannot take back messages or influence messages that were already sent. They need to first attack the process in order to affect the messages that they're gonna send. So SSLE is a good solution for this use case of denial of service attacks. So now that we know what SSLE is, let me present to you what homomorphic tradition is, which is our protocol. Our protocol, it relies on one specific ingredient, ingredient called threshold fully homomorphic encryption. And essentially we need processes to be able to encrypt data unilaterally. But when, when it comes to decryption, they need to, collab to collaborate in order to do so. So each process cannot decrypt the value, but they can partially decrypt it. And once you receive a partial decryption, let's say you're holding A, you can verify that the partial decryption corresponds to A, in which case verification returns true. But if the partial decryption uh, refers to B and you're holding A, it will return false. And finally, once you gather enough partial decryptions, you're able to get the clear text value of A itself. So this explains why we need threshold, but then what about the homomorphic part? So essentially what happens is that once we have the ciphertext of A and B, we can perform like an operation star, which will result in the ciphertext of A plus B. So we can add ciphertext without knowing their clear text values. And we can do the same for multiplication. And this is why the protocol is fully homomorphic. <clears throat> and the idea is that we, we're going to construct circuits, arithmetic circuits that are as simple as possible for, um, for being implemented, uh, such as the comparison and summation. But unfortunately, one of our circuits, which is the hash, is kind of um, heavy, but not, nevertheless, it's still feasible to be done in homomorphic encryption. Uh, I also call your attention that uh, we chose uh, TFHE because of our familiarity with it, but uh, other variants of the protocol could be possible with MPC or trusted hardware, for example. So now that we know what we need, let's look at the protocol itself. Let's look at an example where we have here four processes. So the four processes, they start by registering a secret in, in the, by encrypting a secret that they're going to use in the election. And then in the clear text, what we do is that we take the stake of the processes and we make a cumulative sum. So now we have an array where we kind of have windows and the size of each window is proportional to the stake a whole by the stake held by each participant in the system, okay? And now we need to scale the stake to a, a range that uh, will come later. Uh, essentially, we will have a random number in the home of the domain and, the, and we scale the windows so that the proportion remains the same, but the value of the last uh, entry of the array must be the span of our of our random number. So now this was done in the clear text. Now let's see what happens in, inside the uh, inside the homomorphic domain. That is, everything here can be can be manipulated but cannot be directly read. So as I said, we throw a random number between zero and d minus one, where d was the value that we uh, scaled our vector. Let's say that we get uh, like 639, 1639. And then we find the first position uh, of this array that is greater or equal to the random number that we threw. So essentially what we're doing is that we are selecting randomly the identity of a process with the same probability, uh, with probability corresponding to the fraction of stake that they have in the system. And once we have selected the process, we have created this array with all zeros except one in the position of the processes, the process that will become the leader. We take the secret that they registered and we append with their ID and we just do a dot product and we will get the, the value corresponding to the leader. So these in, in, the, in, in this example, the proof is gonna be the arc with the three appended to it. And now the result of the election, that is the cake is just the hash of the proof. So this is how we put the, the proof inside the cake. We just take the hash, okay? So what happens after that is that 
all the processes, they have done the same, they have followed the same steps and they will bake the same cake. So what they do is that they issue partial decryptions and because all correct processes will issue partial decryptions, we're sure to eventually be able to extract the cake from the homophobic domain to clear text. And moreover, what happens is that because of the threshold, the uh, malicious processes, they cannot decrypt uh, intermediate steps that would leak the identity of the leader before the end of the protocol. So everything is secret and safe. Okay, so now that we have the cake itself, uh, three needs to claim the election. And the way three claims the election is just by sharing the green arc. And then all the processes just take the hash of green with three and they'll see that it becomes the cake. So they recognize three as the leader. So this is an incomplete version of our protocol. Uh, and the problem here is that three needs to register a new secret because if three wants to participate again in the election, they cannot use the green mark again because all processes already know that it refers to three, so they need to change it. And normally in synchrony, this is not a problem because three will become the leader and they will be able to register new secrets and consensus will terminate in this round, meaning that they will, the new registration will be successful. But if the system is not synchronous, which is the case of many blockchains, the re-registration might fail because of asynchrony. That is, process three tries to re-register, but their messages do not arrive fast enough to drive consensus to termination, and then they just simply are ejected out of the system. And this is a property known as expiring registration. And the way we deal with expiring registration is that we have an extra layer between the proof and the cake. So the proof is, uh, uh, the cake remains the hash of the proof concatenated with the ID, but the secret that the process registers is not the proof, but an ingredient to the proof. So what we do is that we take the PRF of the secret with the round, so processes can asynchronously participate in every uh, election using unique randomness for each election. So then again, we just select the secrets of the elected process, but we have this extra step of PRF to produce the proof, and then we go to the, uh, the hash to, be, to find the final value of the election, that is the kick. Okay, so in this short presentation, what I want you to take away is that if you have a consensus system where you might be, have a denial of service attack, then SSLE might be a, a good choice for your system. And if you need SSLE, then you might be interested in homomorphic sortition if you have some of these requirements. First one, large stakes, because other SSLE proposals, they simply say, oh, you just re-register the guy who has S stake S times and it's okay, but that's not okay because sometimes the amount of stake of a process is like a billion, so they cannot register themselves a billion times. This, is not, this does not happen in our protocol. One process is one process in, uh, independently of stake. Then if you need partial synchrony, you need a protocol that uh, does not have expiring registration and you need to do it with feasible uh, and the protocol needs to be feasible with current cryptographic tools, which is the case of our protocol. And finally, uh, we also explore in the paper a nice variant where you might want uh, to have a sequence of non-repeating leaders, and this also comes very naturally with our protocol. So if you have any of these four constraints and you're looking for an SSL protocol, I recommend you to take a look at homomorphic sortition. Thank you for your attention.